I appreciate the time of praise and worship this morning. You know, there's, uh, you know, the uh, when Jason said you're going to sing a lot of holies today. You know, when we see holy, holy, holy in, in the scripture, that's one way that they try. I mean, our our words, our English words, sometimes don't translate very well. And so, in our scripture, we hear when we hear like holy, holy, holy. That's I mean, it's, it's an attempt, if you will, to declare how holy he is. When I don't, know, when I don't believe we can ever fully declare how hold, the holiness of God. Because it goes beyond us. It goes beyond us. So, um, anyway, um, we've been in this series on James, which I've really appreciated. You know, James is kind of like... Uh, uh, James is kind of like, it's, it's kind of like you get slapped and James kind of says, take that. And it's, it's that kind of a book. It's kind of right up front, right in, in your face kind of a book. And uh, I think it's, it's a very practical book, if you will. Um, so what I'm going to do is if you've got your, well, actually, I, I, I hope you have your Bibles, but I'm going to put up on the screen the passages out of uh, James chapter 3, verses eight, uh, 13 to 18. And I'm going to ask us to stand and read it together. I think there's something about standing together and reading this. And so, uh, will you read this with me? Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfishness, there you find disorder, confusion, and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, full of good fruit, and without hypocrisy. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Father, as we read this passage, it's a very, it's one of those passages, Lord God, that uh, you speak very clearly to us. Uh, and, and Lord God, we want to uh, be able to embrace your word and, and into our lives. It's not just hearing, but it's doing. It's bringing it into who we are and and. When we, Lord, when we, we, we take communion, we talk about bringing you into us. Lord God, I pray that your word comes into us. That we think like you think. We do like you do. We speak like you speak, Lord God. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have Amen. a seat. So, how many would say you'd love to be, you, you want to be wise? Yeah. Oh my goodness, how many say you'd like to be wise? Wait, you know what, there are going to be a lot of unwise people out here if, we, if that's the case. You want to be wise. I think we all want to be wise. We, we all want to be, be, have, have wisdom. And uh, most of us want to, want to be known for having good insights and, and having wisdom when it comes to making decisions, good decisions in our lives. And, and, and sad to say that many decisions we make are not based on godly wisdom, or good wisdom, if you will. So, uh, according to verse 13, the gauge that shows how much wisdom a person has, uh, how much wisdom a person has is, is shown, what does it say there? It's shown by their good life and deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. In other words, it's shown by your good life, it's shown by what you do, right? It's shown by how you live, what you do, and, it, 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 and the humility that you carry with that. So we need to keep that in mind. That's what it says. You know what? This person's got pretty good wisdom because it's got some godly wisdom because I see how they treat people. And I see how they live their life. And I see that they always seem to be, they, they do it in a, in a humble kind of a way. So we're talking about that this morning. Uh, we're talking about wisdom, and I titled this, The Two Kinds of Wisdom. 
Because that's what James lays out here is two different kinds of wisdom. Now, it's interesting, our, our world judges, quote, wisdom by how smart you are. Do you know what? If that's the case, I have no wisdom whatsoever because I'm not very smart sometimes. But see, that's the world's definition of wisdom. And, and the definition of wisdom isn't, isn't about how smart you are. I would say the definition of wisdom is about how in tune you are to God's heart, to God's way. And sometimes we think that somebody's really smart because they can get away with things or they take the easy way out, but, but that's really not smart. It's not wise. Have you ever met somebody that seems to be so smart they have no common sense? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? You, they, they are so smart, they know everything about everything, but yet they have no wisdom. They have no wisdom. Wisdom is shown by a way the person handles their life. The decisions they make, how they relate to people, that's how wisdom is shown. You know, I, I've been... You've heard me say this before, but one of the most convicting scriptures to me is out of 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. It says this. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. I mean, that is a, that is a slap in the face to me. It's like taking a two-by-four over me. It says... For those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Whew! That's a mouthful, isn't it? If you say that you are a Christ follower, then you better be following Christ. How about that? You know, we use words and titles so quickly, so easily sometimes. If you say that you are following Christ, then follow Christ. Now, this is one of these things here, when we talk about wisdom, that really, again, fits into this, if you will. Wisdom says we follow Christ and we act that way. Jesus always displayed godly wisdom, and I want to do the same thing. James now gets kind of specific on this topic, and he breaks it down into two kinds of wisdom. Verse 14 and 15, he talks about what, what's termed worldly wisdom. And it talks about where worldly wisdom comes from. Where does, where does this worldly or earthly wisdom come from? It, it describes worldly wisdom as th in three words. It says it's, it's, uh, it's earthly, it's unspiritual, and it's demonic. It's interesting because I said to Sandy this morning before we, when we were at home, I said, you know, it's almost as if James is here kind of getting uh, 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 more and more, dema not demanding, but more stronger about this. He first says it's earthly. And then he says it's unspiritual. Let alone that, it's demonic. It's demonic. Let me break this down just a little bit. What does it mean it's earthly? In other words, it comes from people making stuff up. Can I just put it that way? It comes from people saying, well, I think this is the, this is the right way to go. I think this is the wise way to go. I think we should do this. How, how many of you know that people make up, people make up earthly wisdom? Amen? Amen. Amen? They make up earthly wisdom. They think, oh, this is the great way to go. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's coming. It says it's not coming from above. It's mankind saying, I think this is wise. You know, I think about somebody getting this light bulb over their head in a comic, in a comic saying, I think this is wise. It's earthly wisdom. It's something that's made up. It's not something from above. Now, let me ask you this question with that in mind. How often do you seek God 
in your decision-making process. How often do you seek God? How often do you really, when you, when you have a decision to make, and, and we could say, all right, well, God gave, us, uh, God gave us the ability to know right and wrong and so on, and so there's some decisions that should come automatic. I suppose there are some decisions that should come automatic. But I'm, talking, I'm asking the question this morning and, asking and challenging you, how many times do you stop in your decision-making process and say, huh, what is God's wisdom? What is God's wisdom? How many times do you do that? Because I got to tell you that God's wisdom seems very strange to the world. And I, I, I would like to tell this story in regards to that. I mean... Well, let me ask you this first. Before I jump to that, let me ask the opposite. Have you ever made a decision that seemed counterintuitive, but you believe God spoke it? Yeah. You know, when Sandy and I came here in 95, 1995, we came back, I should say, because we both grew up here, but we came back in 1995. I can, I, I will never forget, I met with, uh, Art and Jim Good at a restaurant in Plymouth. They wanted to talk to me. And they said, hey, we would like you to come to Cornerstone and for, a, for a year and a half, two years maybe, and uh, just help them get back on track, so to speak. And as we talked, I said, okay. So, I mean, I, I try not to be just detail-oriented, but I I asked, well, how much, how much am I going to get paid here? Because I'm moving from a full-time pastor position to another one. Well, Jim kind of put his head, I remember Jim kind of put his head down. And he said, well, we don't have very much. And he shot me the figure he shot me the figure, which was about $15,000 less than what I was making. And I also had benefits what I was making, and they couldn't offer me any benefits. So I came home, and I know we, we, Sandy and I talked, and we prayed, and so on. And I said to Sandy, oh, I don't know how we can do this. And we, this, this seems so dumb, this seems so stupid to make this kind of a move. But guess what? That was earthly wisdom. Because we had to trust God, and God took care of us, and we came here because we believed that was God's wisdom. And that's what God asked us to do. Now, I'm not going to say there weren't a lot of lean years in there. We had to learn to adjust. There were some tears shed in that. And I got to tell you, don't ever think that when you, you, you uh, move in God's wisdom that there's not going to be some pain and some tears in the midst of that. That's not promised us. But it does, we are promised that he will provide, he will sustain, he will comfort right on down the line. Now, It's, un, it's, it's earthly. It's, it's, it's people trying to decide what they think. Do you know what? I, I appreciate counsel. I appreciate people, and I, 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 I seek after counsel as much as I can. But please, don't tell me what quote you think. Tell me what you think God is saying. Because if I'm coming to you for counsel, I'm coming to you for God's counsel, not your smart ideas. Not that you don't have smart ideas, I guess. I don't know about you, but I don't have very many smart ideas sometimes. Earthly, it, it comes, it, this, this kind of wisdom, worldly wisdom comes from the earth. It also says it's unspiritual. In other words, it's, it's not based on anything the scripture says. 
Do you ever think about how many times you, maybe you've made a decision or you've seen somebody make a decision and all of a sudden you think, eee, that really kind of goes against God's word. Do you line up your decisions with according to God's word? Do you line up your decision making? Do you line up how you treat people? Do you line up how you live your life according to what the word of God says? Or again, is it just what you think is right and wrong? Do you realize what our world would be like? And, and granted, it's getting close, it seems like sometimes. But if everybody decided for themselves what's right and wrong. Can you imagine what this place would be? And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a bit. But it says it's unspiritual. It's not based on anything in scripture. How often do you look to see if the decision you're making or the direction you're going is lining up with the word of God? How often do you do that? I hear so many these days that... uh, (laughs) I. Sometimes I'm baffled by Christ's followers that agree with some of the things that are going on in our culture. I'm baffled by it. I'm baffled because it doesn't line up with this. It just doesn't line up with this. You know, over the years, I know... Leaders, we as leaders over the years have always, always, always tried to line everything up with this. Did we make mistakes in that? Sure we did. But we always have tried to line everything up with this. Our culture is trying to tell us a different way than this. And I want to tell you, this is countercultural. It's upside down as far as the world goes. Remember that. Please don't try to fit this in to our culture, what the world says is wisdom. Please don't try to fit this in. Because the world needs to fit themselves into this. This is our roadmap. Don't ever forget that. The last thing he says in regards to, in describing this, is... He goes as far as to say it's demonic. Do you know what that means? Do I need to say what that means? That means, if I could put it this way, that means worldly wisdom is from the pit of hell. It's from the pit of hell. It's demonic. You think Satan wants us to make wise decisions according to the word of God? No. Does he want us to seek out the scripture and for God's choices in our lives? No, he doesn't. The scary part in this whole thing is that often we think worldly ways. We think in worldly, worldly, worldly ways. That's the scary part. We get barraged and barraged by our culture that says this is the, this is the wisdom, this is wisdom, this is wisdom, this is wisdom. And finally, we start to give in and say, huh, okay, well, maybe this is wisdom. When actually, the way we think, the way we're thinking is from the depths of hell. That sounds pretty strong, doesn't it? But I think there's truth to it. It's motivated by Satan and his demons. If you don't believe that Satan is at work in this world, uh, you know, go ahead, go back and bury your head in the sand. Because Satan is at work. And he wants us to make worldly decisions from worldly wisdom. Verses 14 to 15 tells us uh, well, okay, what, what, how, do we, how, how can we tell 
if worldly wisdom is being used. I think James gets really practical here. I appreciate that. How can we tell when it's worldly wisdom? Well, it's said in verse 14 and 15, it says, because there will be bitter envy and self-seeking. Oh, no, we don't have any of that in our world, do we? That must have been back in James's time. The wisdom of the world is self-centered. It measures everything by what's going to benefit me. How is this going to impact me? How am I going to benefit out of this? What's going to happen to me? Me, 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 me. It says the wisdom of the world, it's, it, the wisdom of the world is all self-centered. It's all about what's going to happen to me. And that's how I base my decisions about how it impacts me. <laughs> you know, that is about as far away from this as we can get. The wisdom of the world self-centered. It measures everything about, you know, it's in direct opposite. Put, put that, go ahead and put that next scripture up there. Yeah, the simple scripture that many of you probably know by heart. It says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And that's in Matthew 16, 24. Uh, and a couple of versions of that is, deny himself means give up your own way or set aside selfish interests. <laughs> I don't know how self-centeredness could get as far away from what the Word of God and what Jesus said. So let's play that out in a practical way. You ever found, those that are married, you ever found in your marriage, uh, have you ever gotten a little self-centered? How'd that work out? Did you have fun with that? Didn't work out very well, did it? Over the years of counseling couples, I'm telling you, that is a hook that will get you in marriage. And that is if you start getting self-centered. Again, it's worldly wisdom. It's about me. And it's, it's, it's self-seeking. Oh. That didn't feel good to me. What you did to me. What you did to me. Well, I didn't get my way on this. You know, one of the ways that we, that Sandy and I work at uh, not being self-centered, particularly when it comes to decision makings, it, making is we come into agreement. We come into agreement. In other words, if we come together on a decision and we think it's, it's uh, and we may have two different views, guess what we do? We go back and pray about it again. Because God's not going to send two messages. But we come into agreement. We agree together. And you know what that does? <laughs> so if it goes a little south, and it's what I thought should have happened. If we haven't come into agreement and, it's what it, and it ends up being what I thought we should have done, guess what I can't, guess what I, if I'm in agreement, guess what I can't say to my wife? See, if you'd just done it like way I, the way I thought it should have done, you'd have been fine. No, we own that together. We own it together. We don't just... We, we, we don't just sit there and say, oh, well, I guess you're going to get your way again. No, it's not, it's not either one of our ways. It's what God wants. It's, where it's, it's godly wisdom we're after here. I've heard statements in marital counseling such as, uh, I, I, I'm just not happy anymore. Better be careful. Here, maybe I just better go on. Because, I guess because when people say, I'm just not happy anymore. Do you know what? Could it be that you're the root of your own unhappiness? 
Could it be that you're the root of your own unhappiness because of your self-centeredness? I hear, uh, he doesn't do any, anything for me anymore. Or I'm just not satisfied. Maybe even she's not pretty enough anymore. Wow. Those are all very self-centered statements. That's, that's, that's worldly wisdom. What about using earthly wisdom in parenting? <laughs> it's all about me, Kids, you just, you'd line up to me and, 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 and make me look good and so on and so forth. I had, a, 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 I mean, in your face experience. Believe it or not, Jason was young at one point in time. <laughs> and Jason was just as ornery as anybody else at one point in time. Yes, you were. Don't shake your head, no. <laughs> I will never forget one Sunday morning... And we were, in, we were when I was pastoring a Goshen one Sunday morning. Um, Jason was acting up. It was during our praise and worship time, and and I we're sitting in the second row, and Jason is acting up. He's being Jason. No, I, I, I you know. So you know what I did? I do you have something to say on that, Josh? Amen. I'm being Joel. Being Joel. Oh, you're being Joel. Okay, yeah. You get me. So you know what I did? He was acting up. So I grabbed him like this. I shot him on the chair. And I said, you be quiet. I may not have said it that quite that loud. But it was almost with that much energy. And as soon as I did that, I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me and say, was that about him or was that about you? And I realized that I was disappointing out of me looking good rather than disappointing out of trying to help him and show the right way. Does that make sense? I mean, that was in my, in, in my face. It was, it was wrong. It was self-centeredness. I was worried about what are people going to think if the pastor doesn't discipline his kids. There are probably a lot of things that we as parents regret in how we've done things with our kids. But can I encourage you that worldly wisdom will get you self-centered in your, in, your, in your marriage relationship, in your disciplining of your kids and your family and so on. Worldly wisdom. Parents, if you're more concerned with how you look when your child misbehaves, it isn't, or isn't the perfect athlete, musician, or student. You're walking in earthly wisdom. We see earthly wisdom everywhere in our society. I want to tell you something. There is nothing that, that goes against godly wisdom like the American dream. Remember that? The American dream? The American dream is all about us, right? It's all about you. The best job, the most money or things, the biggest house, the fanciest car, the most, say, the nicest expensive vacations. It's all about me. It's all about me. And then you bring in the envy dynamic that comes with that whole thing of, of self-centeredness. The envy, envy dynamic enters when you're you're never satisfied and you see what everybody else has and you think you need to have that. You know, that's, isn't that a challenge for us too in regards to what we have? Always wanting more. Always wanting more of what they have.
again, I don't know anything else that comes contrary to the word of God than the American dream. Because the Bible teaches us to be givers and servers, not takers. One of the things that we've always stood for here at, in this family is that we will not be takers from our community. We'll be givers to our community. That's actually, when we look at what we've done, what God's done out there. Oh, sure, we, we, we've gotten some gifts from that, so on, some significant gifts, but it was never because we went out and asked for it. Because we believe that God provides. We believe that God su supplies. We believe that God is in it. We don't need to go out and ask others. We don't need to be takers of our community. We need to be givers to our community. Are you content with what you have? How's your contentment level? <coughs> the scripture, next scripture up there says this. It says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Hebrews 13, 5. And also in Philippians 4, 11, it says, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am in. Can you say that? Can you say that you've learned to be content in every situation you're in? I wish I could say that, that I've learned that perfectly, because I can't. You ever notice how can discontentment kind of creeps up and grabs a hold of you now and again? That's that envy that comes up. Man, I wish, oh my goodness, I, 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 I wish I had, had property like the Smiths do. I wish, you know, I wish I had a, had a, had a job, a easy job like John has. You know what I'm saying? It, 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 it creeps up and grabs you. You hear someone getting, get, having a good situation and you sit there and you say, oh man, I wish I was in that situation. I wish I had that. That's that envy coming up. Can I give you a great way to, to counteract envy in that way? When you start to feel that come up a little bit, start praying for that person and asking God to bless them even more. Whoa. Start to ask God to bless them even more. So I should be praying that John has an easier job than he does even. Is that what it is? You understand? Do you get what I'm saying? I, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pray that God continue to bless the Smiths with maybe uh, a lot of livestock and everything else and so on and so forth. Not that I think they want that, but I don't know. But the point being is that if, if I start to feel envy, if I start to feel like, oh man, I wish I had that, I wish I had that, guess what I need to do? Pray for that person that God blesses them even more. When you feel the urge to want what somebody else has, start praying that God bless them even more. Now, it's, it's critical that we look at what earthly wisdom produces. Verse 16. Now, listen to this. For where envy and self-seeking exists comes confusion and every evil thing. That's what worldly wisdom, that's the end result, that's the product that worldly wisdom puts out. Confusion and every evil thing. 
That means where there's earthly wisdom operating, guess what we can expect? Confusion. We can expect disorder. We can expect evil practices. Could we all agree that we see a lot of confusion and disorder in our culture? Could we all agree that we see a lot of evil things happening in our culture? Let me just touch on a few of them. And I know I, these, some of these may not be politically correct. How many of you know there's a confusion on gender? And the worldly wisdom says, children need to be able to decide what gender they really are regardless of what parts they were given. In other words, I'm saying that that, uh, that child uh, has a right to choose. Marriage. People should be able to marry the one they love, even if it's someone of the same sex. I told you this isn't politically correct. But I believe it's correct here. Having children. Nurturing a kid takes too much time and money. By the way, did you know that the birth rates in the United States are as low as they've ever been. Now just a side note for us as Christ followers, the very first chapter of Genesis tells us to be fruitful and multiply. That's God's way of spreading him throughout this earth, is us having kids. That's our first mission field, us having kids, sending them out. Being fruitful and multiply. Oh, but man, I only want, you know, kids are kind of a pain. They take money, and that's money I could be using for this or that. Again, do you hear the sound of that? Do you hear the sound of the self in that? Death and dying. People should have the right to say when, they're, when they can end their own lives. We term it euthanasia. Oh, but that, I mean, I was on a, I was on a Zoom call with, uh, with, it's called a, um, overdose, it's an overdose fatality review. It's OFR, it's called. It's, and what it is, is we, there's a group of us in the uh, county uh, that takes and reviews each, each uh, either overdose death or suicide death and find out where the gaps of help were and where we could have helped better and maybe in the future learn from that. We've had a number of suicides in the last six months of elderly individuals. So I was on the Zoom call and someone made the comment, well, we're never going to get this taken care of until we allow people to say, I want out of this. I don't want, to pain. I want, I don't want pain anymore. And so I want, to t I want to end it. And there's a lot of people, yeah, that's right, and so on. Whew. I've walked with a lot of individuals who late in life were in pain. But I also know that God, the great comforter, was there to walk them through that dark time. 
because we're in pain, because this or that, it's hard. You know what? Life is hard. And I'm trying not to be insensitive to this. But the fact of the matter is, I believe, and I say that with no hesitation, that God gives us our first breath, and he's the one that gives us our last breath. And that, I believe, is here. We can go to pregnancy. A woman should have the right to choose. We all know that one. It's her body, after all. I don't even think I need to go into that. Maybe even careers. The most valuable career is the one that makes the most money or entertains the most people. Those are just a few. Do you hear the confusion in that? Do you hear how confused our society has gotten? Do you hear, according to here, how contrary that is to denying self? It's all self-serving. It's no surprise that we have a ton of confused people and a lot of evil in operation. I got to get moving here. Well, let's go to the contrary. We talked about two kinds of wisdom. Let's talk about godly wisdom. Fortunately, James describes godly wisdom. James says there is another way. There is a different kind of wisdom. There's a godly wisdom, and it can only be found from being on your face before God. It can only be found by being on your face before God. And he lays it out here. It says, first of all, godly wisdom is peaceable. It means avoiding stupid arguments or ugly conflict. It's a, a person who is even-tempered, cooperative, and non-combative. It's characterized by getting along with others. Are you peaceable? Can you get along with others? It puts a high value on easing conflict. How high of a value do you put on easing conflict? Or, or is it all about you're going to make sure that they hear what you, that you, you, you get your way, that you, they hear what you got to say, and that they start to believe it? But it also means free from strife and disorder. I like that. Free from strife and disorder. People that seem to always, you know, you know those people that seem to always have drama in their life? <laughs> we all know some, right? It's always strife. It's always drama. They always seem to be in the middle of something. Godly wisdom is gentle. It means showing a kind or temper, tender temperament. I, I think about the story of Jesus Caught, uh, the woman that got caught in adultery that went before Jesus that they all wanted to stone her. And Jesus come up and he slaps her. And Does he slap her? No. He, he is actually kind to her. He doesn't, he doesn't condone what she did, but he's kind to her in regards to correcting her. How kind are you? Are you kind? <laughs> Common misconception is that is that is that gentleness is is equivalent to weakness or passivity. True gentleness, however, is just the opposite. True gentleness has to it comes from great strength and self control. This wisdom comes from a state of humility. The next one is willing to yield. Godly wisdom is willing to yield. It means willing to give way to another, easy to persuade, not in the sense of being weak, but in the sense of being willing to listen to reason and skilled in knowing when it's important to flex to others. It's one who's not stubborn or obstinate, but rather is cooperative and interested in another's opinion. The whole idea of being willing 
to be willing to be persuaded. Are you willing to be persuaded? Are you stuck in your ways? God's wisdom is full of mercy. It means showing compassion or forgiveness towards someone when it's within one's power to punish instead. It's one that remembers that the same measure of mercy we grant to others is the same measure of mercy that's going to be granted to us by God. Again, it's kindness. Can we just start by being kind to one another? It's a good place to start, isn't it? This wisdom's full of good fruit. Means being able to see right living in someone. It's one who naturally and consistently displays Christ-like character qualities. The next one is the wisdom is with how to proctorcy. It means we're an open book. It means that what you see is what you get. Is that the case with you? Is what you see, is what people see, is what they get? Or are you two different people at home and another person out there when you're around people? Are you two different people? Are you one person at work and another person at home? That's that's, that's, That's hypocrisy. It's one that doesn't pretend to be something they're not. How many times do you wear a mask? I need to wrap this up. Every decision we make is rooted in either godly or earthly wisdom. We're either putting into practice what we know God called us to do or we're living in pursuit of our own selfish desires. One or the other. One or the other. Sorry, we can't have it both ways. We can't sit in the middle of the fence on this. Last week when Chris talked about taming the tongue, I thought, yeah, that's right. How many of our tongues need to be tamed? Or how many of us are sitting in the middle to where, oh, when I'm at church, I'm going to be this way. When I'm with in the work world, I'm going to be this way. That's hypocrisy. I would ask God, I would ask God this morning to deliver you and us from the wisdom of this world, the subtle demonic wisdom of the world. Consider these three steps when making a decision. Take your mindset and focus off yourself. Secondly, consider first and foremost what scripture would direct you to do. And third, evaluate to see if the result of your decision will produce the fruits of righteousness. In other words, right standing with God. I want to finish this morning by, I want us to stand, and we started by reading scripture, and we're going to end by reading scripture. Proverbs is a great book, the Bible. Proverbs chapter 2, and I want you to stand, and I want you to read this with me together. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as a hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield for those who walk blameless. He guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair. Every good path. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will protect you and understanding will guard you. Wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men, from men whose words are perverse, who have left the straight path to walk in dark ways, who delight in doing wrong and rejoice in the perverseness of evil, whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. 
Wisdom will save you also from the adulterous woman, from the wayward woman with her seductive words, who has left the partner of her youth and ignored the covenant she made before God. Surely her house leads down to death and her paths to the spirits of the dead. None who go with her return and attain paths of life. Thus you will walk in the ways of the good and keep to the paths of the righteous. For the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will cut off from the land and the unfaithful will be torn from it. Wow. Godly wisdom. Amen. God, I just pray over this, over all of us here, this family, that we, we would, uh, we would, that Lord God, you would expose the worldly wisdom in us and continue to plant the godly wisdom within us as we hear your voice and study your word. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Just, Amen. just have a seat. I'm going to invite John up.